back to another video. This is Motivation for Christians. Welcome back, welcome back. Today we will be doing another Bible study. And good thing for today, guys, we have a lot of new people to join us along on this journey. We have Brother John Lee with us. We have my brother Elton with us. We have Brother Nathaniel with us. Sister Brandy and Brother Chris. To begin, we're going to start off with a prayer by me. And right after the prayer, Brother John Lee will be leading us. If you can, just bow your heads and close your eyes. Father God, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. We thank you for this day that you have made our rejoice and began it, God. We pray that this morning as we come together to discuss your word, God. We pray that we're able to discuss your word and just enjoy ourselves and just be able to fellowship with each other, God. We pray that this chapter will be able to give us a good message, God. Something that we'll be able to learn and take with us through this upcoming week, God. We just pray for your guidance and protection, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, man. Hey, morning, y'all. Morning again. Hope everyone's doing all right. Had a good week. Gio is not here this morning, so I'm, as brother as Ron said, I'm going to try to do what Gio does and lead up a little bit. Um, we're in John chapter nine, verse twenty-two, and we're going to try to finish it up. Correct, as well. So John, John nine, twenty-two to forty-one. 22 to 41. Cool. I'm in the uh, New Living Translation, but if you have a different one, um, you can follow along. All right, so last week we started, we started speaking about uh, Jesus brings light to the blind. Um, Ezra, you want to do a quick recap to share with everyone what we discussed? Yes. Um, I don't remember exactly where Jesus met the blind man, but he did. What surprised me, instead of just like putting his hand over it, um, the blind man and just making him see, Jesus ended up doing this whole thing with the clay and the mud and and then some something with spit. I don't, I don't remember where the spit was involved with it, but he was able to use that to bring the guy's vision back. And at this time, the Pharisee was still obviously caught in to kill God. It was always quite, I'm not God, Jesus, and always questioning, like, why are you saying you're the Messiah? You're not the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come down in the grand entrance and so on and so on. So after Jesus did this, it was just another, it just gave them another reason to just continue to hate on Jesus and just give them more reasons to want to kill him. Yeah, definitely. I think Gio touched on um, generational curses as well, right? Why this man was actually blind from his birth. And so we spoke about uh, one part of it could be generational curse, but then there's some times when you just have to go through certain things. Right? Like you just have to go through certain suffering. But in it all, God always gets the glory. Right? One thing we discussed is that we, our lives, have, we have to be a billboard for Jesus. Meaning that he has to we have to reflect them in all that we do. We have to advertise God in all that we do so that he gets the glory. Right? So now we at um, verse 22. And usually we just read this, the verses and we go through it. And Gio and I will stop off and we'll, you know, we'll try to engage Ezra in some conversation and try to break it down. And so we'll do the same this morning. Uh, we usually don't go too, too deep, kind of keep it surface level so that when Anyone on YouTube or Facebook watches Ezra's videos, they're able to understand and not get lost in whatever we're saying. All right? So at any point, anyone feel free to ask a question and chime in. Now let's break down and see what God has to say to us from verses 22 to 41. And so 22 says, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the, was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said he is old enough, ask him. So from the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Why, 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 believe, why do you think they believe Jesus is a sinner? Because remember he worked on the Sabbath day and that basically set them off. After they saw that he worked on the seventh day, they just kept holding Jesus accountable to that. 
But also, the Pharisee was working on the Sabbath day too. But I found the Mosaic law of, um, was it baptism? Baptism? Baptism. They actually do not keep the Sabbath day holy, but they didn't want it to put fingers to themselves. So they pointed fingers right to Jesus and just kept him accountable after that. Oh, and to just give another backstory um, based on these two scriptures, uh, after the Pharisee saw that the guy um, got his vision back, they was questioning his parents and asking him, was your child always blind? Did he always see? And, uh, and a whole lot of questions. So that just gives you like an info on why they was asking the parent that question. This came ready. Anyone else? Chime in, add anything? So these Pharisees were so religious, right, that, uh, that any time Jesus did anything on the Sabbath, they had a problem with it. They wanted to condemn him. Oh, it's the Sabbath. You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, but Jesus is showing them that I'm here to meet the needs of the people, uh, whether it's Sabbath or not. I'm here to meet the needs um, of the people, right? 25, it says, I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man of God. But I know this, I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man so now they're questioning the man. Who is this man? What what did he what did he do for you? How do you know he is not a sinner? And so they question him, but the man does not know. And I think Ezra, we spoke uh, last week that we have to know why we believe, right? We have to know why we believe why we believe uh, Christ is Lord of our lives. Why why we believe that He came and died for us? Is we have to know why we believe, right? So that when someone, we encounter someone that may not know Christ, uh, we're not choked up. I remember I shared that story with you, Ezra, right? right? I was handing out pamphlets a long time ago, um, just handing them out, tracts. And someone asked me, why you believe? And I choked up. I don't know. I'm just here handing out these pamphlets, trying to share the word with you. But all the time, we have to know why we believe. And I'm sure, uh, Brother John and Brother Nate can attest to that. Uh, we have to know our why, right? Yeah, I, I, I'll jump in with that. Because um, especially now, I mean, you have to be able to be able to say, hey, this is why. Oh, actually, even going before, I think even with the, hearing a little snippet of the story here is, I think sometimes, especially for us that grew up in church, we, we believe in Jesus by inheritance, not necessarily by experience. And so it's easy for us to, it's at times to communicate, hey, this is my faith because we've inherited. But it's a whole different story once you truly experience the Christ for yourself. Um, and even looking at this, these couple of verses itself, you know, it's like the question in this young man is like, well, what happened? Um, and he just like, he'd be keeping it real. He said, all I know is I've experienced God. I mean, you want me to break down A, B, C, D, E, F, G. At the end of the day, I've had an encounter with this man, Jesus, and you can't take that away from me. So it's not that he just inherited like the Pharisees. He have actually had the experience. So we have to have the experience and just stand on that. Man. I always uh, agree with that part too. Yeah. A lot of us need to focus on the why because the inheritance of the faith is good, but at the same time, if somebody asks you a question, you got to be able to give a valid answer. Yeah, that's that is um a great takeaway from that. Knowing the why, you also have to really just not forsake, um, not really forsake what was happening here. Because, you know, what's amazing is that the religious leaders of Pharisees were trying to control the narrative. Um, you have to be careful who's around you that's trying to control the narrative. You see this as a common theme through the book of John, that tension 
they want to control the narrative of how the Messiah looked, what 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 he was all about. And um with this man that experienced the miracle, as my bro was uh, alluded to, it, it was really by experience, you know. It wasn't something he inherited. This wasn't some these guys inherited it. They their parents were teachers for a long time. So they had some kind of narrative, but they never dug into their why. They never dug, they never really searched out. And um, you can even highlight and say, you could go back a couple chapters and see where he confronts them talking about you, you were searching the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But the whole time it's referring to me, but you don't want to receive me. And because they didn't want to receive, there's a tension now of them trying to control the narrative of who else can or would receive that encounter and that experience. And sometimes we go into that, we, have, we experience that as well. You know, so, and I, and I love how he said, listen, I, I don't know what you're looking for. I don't know what narrative you're looking for. I'm just telling you. And this is the power of testimony. Um, Jave had told a story. I remember one time when I was in the, in the early years of my witnessing on Jamaica Avenue, I had a similar encounter. Um, I, I, I couldn't answer in depth. As I told the man, I said, you might, you might know more than me. You're probably going to know more than me. But all I know is that Jesus Christ changed my life. You might say it's not enough because how you want to control the narrative. If, if you want to be out here in these streets evangelizing, with all the knowledge you got, come in this corner and do it too. I didn't, think, I didn't say it to be mean, but I was saying, listen, I know what Jesus Christ did for me. and There was a passion in my heart to share that. That's my why. As I grow in getting to know God, my why will deepen. So I'll get the knowledge. I'll get the information. I'll get everything else that I don't know today. That blind man didn't know much, but he knew he was blind. But today I can see. Man, I love that. Love that. And just to piggyback on Brother John was saying, Brother Nate, uh, a lot of us, we, we inherit uh, this Christianity or this walk as we grew up in church with our parents. Uh, but we have to do, we do have to experience God for ourselves because our parents' faith ain't gonna get us into heaven, right? Because your parents took you to church when you were younger. That ain't gonna get you there. You have to know Christ for yourself, right? And that's what we want young people to know. Yeah, you have to know him for yourself. You have to have your personal relationship with him for yourself. You can't be saved through better John, or through me, through Elton, as well. You have to know him for yourself, all right? Anyone else wanna chime in? Keep going. I got to reach out, I even, I guess, piggybacking off of you. Um, and I like something that you said earlier at the beginning is, uh, it was become an experience in God. It's not some deep experience. I think sometimes people are waiting for this deep, you know, like even like the scripture that we're reading, like we're looking for the Lord to spit on mud and put it on our eye type thing. And it's, it's, it's not like that. You know, you experience God even sometimes just when you wake up. So it's really, it's not, not looking for God in like the big boom, but understanding that God isn't just a little simple thing. And, and that's, that's enough for me. For me, hey, I see God. Then go for yeah. it. Yeah. Love that. And don't worry, we do not know why they used spit back in the days when they could use other things. I don't really know why they do, did that. So I just like to put that out there. <laughs> Man, imagine being back back in that time. And Jesus said, I'm going to hear you. And then me spit on my hand real quick and get some mud, some dirt from the ground. You'd be like, whoa. That would not work with me. Um, <laughs> I want to, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Brandon. I want to agree with what Brother John just recently said because I I did um inherited like um this Christianity from... Uh, my parents growing up because my entire family is Christian. Everybody, most of my family are pastors and um, just, you know, all around preachers, women, men. So what he said, what Brother John just said is that you cannot wait. When he said you cannot wait, that's what I thought I had to do. I had to wait to experience it. I didn't know that, you know, it was just like, boom, like, Something is going to happen. God is going to work for me. And I got to wait on that experience for myself. So 
when I recently moved to America, that's when I started experiencing stuff for myself and understanding what's going on, asking so much question about why is this, what is this, why is God doing this, and those type of stuff. So that's what got me so much like in depth with um, just my Christianity in general. Love it, love it. That's good. Amen. I could, I could oh. talk to that too. Um, same thing with um, Brandy too. Okay, I both side of my family is Christian. I inherited Christianity, and and guy and I enjoyed it. But when I got over there, I was I was not with it. I was not trying to go to church. I was not trying to hear gospel, nothing like that. But when I when I got in deep with it myself and started experiencing God and His good working. I started to love it more, and I was like, you know what? Let me share it on the platform I have, and it, well, here we have it today. <laughs> As you were saying that, um, I think one thing for listeners to take away, for those, and I've always been like one to wrestle with this, to be honest, because you know it's easier. I, I feel like, especially in this day and age, more people give more voice to those that had the experience away from inheritance. Let me, let me clarify that. What I mean by that is that those that grow up in church and they may, may have been faithful to the process, committed their life to serving God from a young age, and it's, it's different. It almost feels like the story is different from those that were like radically saved off the streets. And I'm not trying to you know just annul that because every testimony, doesn't matter how you got in, you got, you got into the way. I just want to speak to encourage somebody. If you look later on in the scriptures about Timothy's story, Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, tells Timothy that's why you need to stir up your faith because of the inheritance. It was inherited. It's a part of your family's history. Um, so there's a difference between you inheriting it, meaning it's a part of your heritage, and you don't know what to do with it, or you've become puffed up because of it, versus you have it as an inheritance part of your heritage, a part of your family narrative, and it's a part of the story of God that continues through your family. There's a difference. The Pharisees inherited the knowledge, but they became puffed up. But as for us who come into Christ, and it's now part of the story of our generations, and I like the stories that you guys gave, your experience, how you got there was different, but you were grateful because the heritage that you got caused you to do exploration. So there is a difference between the two. Nobody may I make sense with that. There's a difference between the two. Becoming arrogant with it, but or exploring the heritage in, in, in which you receive. Yeah, I mean, I love that. Love that. All right, so we're at verse 30 now. Continue. The Bible says, Why that strange? The man replied, He healed my eyes, yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. And ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. What what's going on here? Elton, first. People we haven't heard from yet. I think what's happening here is cause like they're doubting him because like he's not someone of the church, like he's just somebody random. And we're like, what is like coming out of his mouth is like something that's unheard of. So it's very hard to believe someone that's not a part of the church and that's telling them something impossible. Okay, good. As what's going on here? What you got? Um, you remember earlier in John, uh, when Jesus, I don't remember what miracle he did, but they was all on Jesus. Now, right after that, they just turned their back away. So to me, this is just a repeat of what they did in um the early John. And the thing that um, just confuses me is that they saw all the stuff that Jesus did in the early John and leading up to here, and they was they was praising God for it. I mean, Jesus for it. 
But now when he do something else, it's like they just turn their back when they was praising him for doing this and doing that. So I'm I'm just confused by that. Also in the in the text, um, what's going on? You're seeing the tension. Um, as you continue to grow and study the scripture, you'll see sometimes there's themes of like tension. You see the tension now of the religious leaders trying to control the narrative or control his story. So this is what we were kind of alluding to in the earlier verses that you kind of start to see it in droplets, but now you see the momentum of the Pharisees trying to control the narrative and control how he testifies. Because the Bible, he, he said, you know, you know, you know where God stands with this, that God doesn't listen to somebody who's not pure of heart, that that's a sinner. And consider this, this was done to help me become closer to God, quintessentially. And um, the, the, the fact that you're asking how and where did this miracle come from, I think there might be something wrong with you. And as you read further on, you're going to see the confrontation come to head between Jesus and the religious leaders. But now you see the tension, the momentum of that tension swelling up, um, of, of one trying to control the narrative and one staying true to what God did for them. So that that so just to answer something Ezra was saying, I think what happened here is this the simple fact that they were glad to see something at first on surface level that wasn't done before. But when it began to now challenge, when it comes down to challenge to shake the source of where it was coming from, they thought they had the idea of what the Messiah was going to look like, how he was going to do what he was going to do. And because a lot of things started becoming unorthodox in the approach, in their mind, they wanted to control the story. So you see it starting to build up. Absolutely. Love it. Anyone else? And even the man, based on that, that small encounter, that brief experience of healing, or that experience of healing he had from God, um, he, he declares that if this man was not from God, there is no way that this could have happened. So even him, when he was confronted, or that tension, as, as Brother Nick said, started to build up, um, he was sure about it. If this man was not from God. He couldn't have done it. And I remember the scripture that says, uh, with man, things may be impossible, right? But with God, all things are possible. Every, anything, anything, as long as you believe, uh, all things are possible, right? And just to come out of the context of, of the story and, and related to our lives, whatever you're believing God for, right? Uh, believe that all things are possible. God can do absolutely anything, right? Nothing is too hard for God. And so whatever situation you may have, and it seems impossible, it seems uh, difficult, uh, know that with God, all things are possible. We can rest in that assurance this morning, right? That God is able. He said in his word, right? Ephesians 3, uh, 20, that he is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think this is the God we serve, right? But I also want to I want to challenge you. Also take this question out of the context of the story per se. Um, the, the, they said to him, uh, "You were born a total sinner," right? Reminding him of his past, reminding him of what he'd been through. And and so because of that, he, they said to him, "Are you trying to teach us?" And they threw him out of the synagogue. Question for you. Have you ever, because of your belief, been thrown out of the synagogue? Right? All right? We could change the word synagogue. Have you ever, because of your belief, been thrown out of the circle, a group of friends, right? What you are accustomed to, right? What you used to do in the past. Have you ever been thrown out because of your newfound belief? Um, I'll say not for believing in God, 
but as like as a Christian, like some of the stuff you don't like take part in. More like that, yeah. Good. Okay. As I saw you in deep deep thought. Yeah. Uh, I would say that had happened, and then also with what Elton said, um, with doing stuff that was not situated with God. But you know, but I'm thankful for those situation because in those situation, you really sh it really shows you who is your people's. And whoever got to be removed, you could just easily see right there. And yeah, they not for me. When I started out in, in my walk also, um, I, for what I believed, I think at the time of life when I was believing it, as a teenager, when you have so much of your life ahead of you, um, and then you're so staunch and you, you, be, you, you become resolved that he's Jesus the way, and it's become a part of your story. Um, uh, for me, I know there was going to be a barrier naturally. I think what sometimes can be the problem is embracing your own difference um, and being okay with being kicked out of what you call the synagogue or like a social circle or so. You, you as a teenager at first, because you, one of the tensions of being a teenager is trying to find where you fit in socially in general. So now when you embrace the faith, especially from a young age, one of the challenges could be is like, you know, are you okay with, and that was an initial wrestle for me, are you okay with um, not being accepted in every type of synagogue, every social setting? Um, and that was something in the early phase that was a tension for me. But until I embraced my difference, until I embraced that portion that's going to come with following Jesus sometimes. Um, and then also just being okay with my, I guess being okay with the, the, the newfound borders or the newfound difference that some people may have. But then also at the same time, you don't use that to like beat down people because I, I had another, I had a similar a peer that used it to condemn people, you know, and we, I always found myself being like the apologist whenever in social settings that happen. But I'm just sharing that because the reality is that man that was blind, he embraced this difference quickly because of what was done. And he was okay with being kicked out because his life didn't fit their narrative. And um, it's something I first had wrestled with, but as I grew older, I became okay with it. And then also there's always a synagogue or, or the social circle of people that will accept you and speak into your faith and help build you up. So being honest, it's not always easy to be kicked out of the center, especially when it comes at a time when you're a teenager and you're trying to discover who you are in general. It, that's a whole nother tension in and of itself. But from my experience, I had to embrace it. Uh, over time, I did. It wasn't always easy, though. So kudos to that blind man for being able to embrace his difference from the time he received his miracle and his experience amen amen love it right. sometimes i love to tell young people uh that you may seem like the minority right because majority is in the synagogue or in that social circle right but it's okay it's okay uh, to not be there it's okay because what you will find as you grow in god and you connect with people on the same walk as you, you will find so much more joy and even more fun that you're, you're really not missing out on anything. Your mindset changes, right? Your idea of what is fun changes, right? The conversations that you should have, the things that you should do, it changes as God continues to work in you and as you continue to grow in him. So though you may seem like the minority at that time, God will surround you with the right people. So verse 35, uh, question, yeah. was, was, was it really this blind man? Was he, one, was he really the one that was blind? No. Remember we said this last week? Um, 
And the man was physically blind, but the Pharisee was spiritually blind. Okay, okay. So 35, it says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the son of man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, are you saying we are blind? If, we, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. And that brings us to the end of uh, chapter nine. But uh, we see Jesus saying to the Pharisees too, you're the ones that are really blind, not this man. Yes, this man was blind physically, right, until Jesus healed him. But the Pharisees, the one that, that were truly blind uh, spiritually, they just couldn't see beyond them. Uh, the laws. We know that the laws uh, were in place and read in the Exodus uh, to show the people how sinful they were, right? Uh, not something that, yes, they were meant to live and abide by them, but it was really in place to show how sinful they were, right? And that's why we need the Savior because none of us could keep the law. That's why we need Jesus Christ. And so here the Pharisees are trying to keep the law, and in trying to keep the law, they're missing Christ. And so the man was healed and now he can see. But even in, in all of that, the Pharisees, they still couldn't see. They were still blind, right? Can anyone want to chime in and, and add to that? I'll, I'll chime in because um, that, last, that last portion of the scripture is like such a boom, sobering moment, at least for those that are already in in christ already in the church in the kingdom whatever it may be we can't be so caught up in following church that we lose christ and i think a lot of times um even as an adult even as someone that's growing even as a leader in the church it's always keeping myself um really humble uh that the word still works on me that i i, I can't be the type to say uh oh, I need to wear this collar. I need to walk around on this particular title or position. It's, it's, it's always about still being able that my eyes be open. Or we, we can't be so caught up on our tradition or what, what we used to do or what we think church should be. We have to always see um, our understanding of God, that he's, he's bigger than what we think. Um, he's bigger than what we try to um, gather of him and hold on, but we must always be realized Always look to God. Always look to Jesus. Always let Jesus. I, I learned something, and I'll hush from tangent. Jesus always re reveals himself to you. Today, he could be your father. Tomorrow, he'll be your friend. The next, he could be your husband. The next, he could be your savior. The next, he could be your healer. But you have to not get stuck on one revelation of who he is. Wow. You must be able to let your eyes continually be open to who God is in all that he is and all that he does. Man, love that. To piggyback on that too, first to piggyback per se, um, also just to add on to that is that, man, he, the, the, the chapter closes so interesting. It's like, okay, in the beginning, you have a physically blind man. And at the end of the chapter, uh, for first, in the beginning, let me go back to the beginning. The beginning of the chapter, you have a man that's physically blind that needs healing. And then at the end of the chapter, Jesus is uncovering something so power, paramount. He shifts it. He's like, yo, there are people that are spiritually blind, need healing, won't acknowledge that they need healing, won't acknowledge that I'm the one that will bring healing. And that's something that just that stuck out, stuck out to me as you were reading it, Jave, because that was part of why he came the, that judgment that he talking about is the separating the the separating of 
okay, who's going to believe and accept? Who's going to hear it and not accept? And um, that's still something that's happening today. And even if you look at it in a modern context, um, who will receive his story and not try to make it their own narrative or try to control who received Jesus uh, or try to um, act like they see, but they're really blind themselves in, in their heart? Because the blindness wasn't a sight issue for the eyes. The blindness was their heart. Their heart was blind to the Savior. Their heart was blind to Jesus being the way. And after all he was showing and he continued to show, you're going to continue to see that in the chapter. Every issue was a reflection of their heart. So they had a blind, they had a blind spot or they just had blinders over their heart concerning who Jesus was. And they wouldn't come to him. And I think that's something that can be so heartbreaking as somebody that reads it. And, you know, somebody that we want to see the world saved, want to see people coming to know Christ. Help us to deal with the blind. That's like a prayer as, as I look at it. It's like help us to address that spiritual blindness amongst the believers, but also for those that are in the world that don't see because the God of this world, as Second Corinthians 4 talk about, has covered their eyes, yes. blinded their eyes to him. So yes. that's, that's something I've taken away from me as you were reading it, seeing what the Apostle Paul was talking about. But the God is world blinding, so yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise yeah, God. I like the I like the fact that the man, after he experienced the God, he went ahead through faith because a lot of us get that encounter. God showed himself to us in different ways. We sometimes ignore it. Because you know, some people be like, God sent me a signal. But God sent you a signal and you you just got your blinders on. You're not you're not seeing it. So I, I just like the I just love the fact that he was able to recognize that this was God. And even though he didn't know God, he had that heart to want to know God. So I really like that. You got anything? Um, I think that this the that last part of the the chapter. I said, wow, because it's so interesting. It, it kind of does, and with what Bre Brother Nathaniel just said, it, it kind of does relate to, like, what's going on now in the world. Like, people are just blind to the fact that, you know, Black people are being treated, you know, so badly, and people are just blind to, to what's really going on. So people got to open their eyes and see, like, this is, is 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 a very spiritual thing. It, it really is. That that last part just hit, just hit home for me. Good, good. Man, praise God. With Elton, you got anything with Elton? Um, no. Yeah. Wait, really, John? Did you did you say anything? Did I say anything? Absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. This morning, this morning, giving me memory loss. I apologize. Um, oh, coming back in. I'll add though, at least going with uh, where everyone's going, at least and more so, I guess, challenge us as we continue to go. Just continue to have a relationship. One thing that always sticks out with, with passages of scripture like this is. Um, of course, one, knowing Jesus, knowing the Father, but also we can't forget, um, I'll, I'll, some might call it basic, I just call it crucial, a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that might open up a whole nother can of worms, but it's getting to the place of knowing the Holy Spirit to allow him to speak and, and just help us. Because um, all of us can fall to being blind, regardless of a spiritual matter or even a natural matter like Brandy was talking about. We, there's so many things that if we're not careful, we can fall blind to. Sometimes um, even um, for me, it is uh, what always sticks out to me with passages like this is to never let my heart get hard. Uh, never let my heart get to the place that I, I can't be compassionate. Never get, let my heart get to the place that even I feel so hurt that I can't love in the midst of it. So it's, it's really important in the midst of it uh, for us to use these scriptures Holy Spirit, help me. Help me out. I, and just keep it. This is plain like that. Like I said, we're not trying to be deep. It's not anything that you need to go down to the 20-foot part of the pool. It's just simple as water in the, my toe in the water saying, Lord, I just need you. I just need you, Holy Spirit. I just need your help. Yeah. And just go from there. Amen. Amen. 
All right, Chris, you had anything? Cool. Oh. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't hear what y'all was saying because for some reason my sound went out. So I don't really. No worries. This, this uh, you can rewatch the video and uh, wow. post it. All right. Cool. But no, nah, it's been what I've what I've been hearing so far is pretty good. You know, you have just any taking time? just taking my notes. <laughs> yeah, love it. And I, we'll end on that note. And for me, you know, just the last part is. Just going back off of what the John was saying is, uh, Holy Spirit, give me fresh vision. Help me to continue to be able to see uh, what you want me to see. And I think a while ago, I believe it was Brother Nate, that you preached on uh, God, God give me a new sight, you know, not just the ability to see, right? I remember that message. That was you, right, Brother Nate? Uh, a while ago, right? Um, but give me fresh vision. Help me peel the scales off my eyes. And so. That, that's my, my takeaway too, that God, you will always allow me, help me by your Holy Spirit to be able to see um, that which you want me to see. And I won't become spiritually blind. Um, Ezra, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, I will do my closing and then I'm going to end off with the intro. Everybody, if you can, just bow your head, close your eyes. I'm going to do my prayer. Father God, we thank you, we worship, we praise you, God. We thank you for the day that you have made our rejoice and began in the kind. We pray as now as we just finish this Bible study, was able to fellowship with each other, was able to piggyback off of each other, I did, was able to understand your word, God. And we pray as now as today that none of us are spiritually blind or physically blind, God. We pray that we'll be more open to every single thing that you sent our way, God the different ideas, the different thoughts, the different actions, God, wherever you bring our way, God, we pray that we're not spiritually blind, God. We pray that we're able to observe it and really do it and take it into action, God. We pray as now, I just pray that this video was able to bless somebody, have a good impact on somebody live, God, and they'll be able to just pass the message on to somebody else, God. We love you and we thank you, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, this is for the video. Thank you so much for coming back. Matt. Today, we was able to have a lot of people with us. Um, I'm just open to just bringing more people on this journey with, with me because we all we all um, don't know every single thing in the Bible. And it's just, we just have that heart to continue to learn more. This is Motivation for Christians. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and share with somebody that you believe with benefit from this video. I'm out.